Hi everyone, so um, I wanted to continue today with our discussion of graphics. Uh, last class what we were doing was working through some case studies to illustrate some of the principles that we developed in talking about graphical display of information, particularly about how to use R and the painterly method in R of layering different components of the graphics on top of each other until we ended up with something that really communicated our message. So we were taking a lot of time to go over how we would actually do that and what it means to effectively communicate a message. Um, so one of the cases at the end of the fourth slide deck on, on graphics is CO2 levels at Mauna Loa. So the Mauna Loa um, data is uh, special in a way, and uh, sometimes you hear it being mentioned in the press or um, in discussions around climate or policy and so on. And one of the things that makes it very special is this is one of the first um, uh, detection devices for CO2. So this is one of our longest records that gives us uh, CO2 changes from one continual um, sensor. So, um, so Maybe we can think about how to take data, like from uh, the Mauna Loa Observatory, which, by the way, is in Hawaii, and, um, and think about how we might actually display that data and what types of problems we might expect to run into and how we can think about solving those problems. Okay, so let's see. All right, so here's, the, here's a picture of the Mauna Loa volcano. You can see um, in this inset on the left side here how this is in um, Hawaii. Uh, as it says, you can see this is our largest volcano, four kilometers above sea level, and uh, the summit is actually 17 kilometers high. So what, what happens is we're able to actually put a detector um, up there and actually take high-quality observations of the CO2 in the atmosphere. This is about, um, this is, you know, a very exciting thing to be able to do for CO2 measurements. Okay, so on the right in the inset here, you can see um, it just the, the elevation that, um, that happens with Mauna Loa, actually. And you can see the cavity in the middle here. Okay, um, so what we're doing in um, uh, the Mauna Loa Observatory is, like I said, sampling air. Um, you can see there are natural advantages. One, as I said, it's very high, and we're taking samples um, quite high in the atmosphere. And, or at least for something that's on the Earth <laughs> quite high. Um, and then the other thing that's, that, that's interesting is, of course, Hawaii is quite isolated in the Pacific. So we're not trying to take CO2 samples, for example, in um, a, a city, for example, if there happened to be a city that was that high up, which there isn't, but <laughs> if we were. So there shouldn't be that much contamination. So we should end up with um, uh, pretty clean samples. Okay, so um, our longest continuous record of CO2 measurements since 1958 when they set up this observatory. Okay, so as all of you know, we're interested in um, understanding CO2 levels in the atmosphere, in the environment, um, to try and understand causes of, well, the nature of, of climate change and possible causes of climate change. So, for example, CO2 um, increases in the environment as we burn more fossil fuels. CO2 is one of the byproducts. So that's one of the reasons why we're very interested in this. So if this is affecting um, uh, changes in our climate, being able to measure the, the effect of CO2 or perhaps correlate this with changes and understand these changes is a very interesting question. So we have bounds that are established as safety limits, where um, the bounds that are established is 350 parts per million, which is our safety limit for atmospheric CO2. And so we're interested in the question, uh, if CO2 increases, do we see uh, an increase in world temperatures? Now, I think you may... Um, uh, question that or want to ask a different question and I think those are all exactly legitimate so maybe something like a direct correlation between CO2 and rising temperatures um, might not be as apparent there might be other aspects of the system um, of course atmosphere and climate are extremely complicated systems but um, for our class we're just going to look at the, the simple question of um, what's happening with temperature and what's happening with CO2 and especially since we have a good source of CO2 increases from 1958. So we're starting to contextualize our data and our analysis and um, I think the first question that probably popped into a lot of people's minds is uh, well 1958 that's a long time 
on the other hand, uh, wouldn't it be great to have had that observatory set up and taking measurements before, say, the Industrial Revolution or, or, or other factors that we believe have had a big impact on CO2 in the environment, of course. But we, you know, we, we do the best we can with the data we've got. And that is part of the art of not just data science, but um, in the visual display of the inferences and um, information that's actually in the data as well. So, of course, we can't go back in time and reset sensors, which would be wonderful if we could do that. In fact, if we could do that, we probably would, you know, be able to answer a lot more <laughs> of these scientific questions. Um, uh, but, but we can't, so, so we're going to have to just display the data as best we can. So one of the things to always uh, think about, so I've been kind of hammering a lot in class about having that one message or the one piece of information that you really want to communicate in your graphic, it doesn't necessarily have to be one, but it should be a very, very simple um, message. You, you shouldn't be trying to communicate five different important different points with a graphic. So you have your, your one message. And, um, and then as soon as you start zeroing in on what that information is that you want to include in your um, or communicate in your graphic, then all these subtle issues start to arise. So there are subtle issues as we've been seeing in terms of design, color choice, um, how you actually display the information um, uh, on the graph, uh, how do you actually do this in, in a clear way. We did that exercise last day um, looking at curves versus straight lines and how our eyes seem to be better in general at picking up differences in straight lines and doing comparisons in straight lines rather than curves particularly when it came to things like area. Um, but we, then we also start to, to push on these issues around um, accurate representation of the data. So by definition, any model or any visualization, it reduces the amount of information that we have in the data. And this is necessary because the data are very complicated in general. Usually it's reasonably large data sets, not the type of thing you could just read with your eye. So you need to at least summarize the data in some way. So if you think back to our box plots, for example, with the Berkeley housing data, um, the box plots were a way of summarizing the distribution information over the, those variables we were interested in around housing. So by definition, you're making choices about what's important in the data set that you want people to pick up and what you think is probably noise or not important. And of course you can see there's an opportunity to mislead. So if people have a particular agenda around the data or they want the data to um, communicate certain things, it's not particularly difficult if you just have a plot to you know, torture the data and have it come out to say what you want it to say in a sense. Um, however, this is um, you know, nothing to do with science. That's to do with things like storytelling and making things up. As a data scientist, you um, want to be um, very vigilant about making sure your summary of the data is accurate and you're communicating what you've done with the data in such a way that people can understand your visualization. So we've started talking about issues around transparency and reproducibility in the class and this is this starts to touch on some of those issues. So for example, if you um, have a visualization and you think it's doing a very good job of communicating the um, information that you think is in the data set. And it also does a good job of trying to um, communicate to your viewers or readers um, what pieces of information were eliminated or if there were any distortions. We had that discussion around the jitter function, if you remember. Um, so trying to be basically as honest as possible and again being intelligent about choosing what is important or salient information to communicate. It's also really good to be able to give your readers, if they would like it, a way to trace through all the steps that you took in generating that plot. So for example, we may have the best of intentions as data scientists, but none of us are perfect. And there are usually, or maybe almost always, um, other ways of interpreting the data or things we might have overlooked or other data sources we didn't include. These things are always, in a sense, inherently unstable. So what we're doing when we're communicating our um, results from our analysis, whether it's in a plot or a model or whatnot, we're, we're trying to contribute a little bit to that conversation. We're not ever really saying that we have the definitive answer. And so we always want to keep ourselves as open as possible to have other people look at what we've done, 
evaluate the decisions that we've made, even some of the small plots that we've gone through in class, there's lots and lots of tiny decisions that have been made, and even just in coming up with those um, relatively simple example plots that we've been doing. So the, to come back to Mauna Loa, so th this is a case in point where we're going to be making these um, small decisions, and um, I think it's important if you are um, a serious scientist that you're capturing and recording all those small decisions that you've been making to do the display of data, and that that's something that can also be communicated and made available to people. So there, that's an evolving part of data science now, but it's very important to um, get that under your belt. Uh, it's not something in general that travels with um, just the image, for example. So you have a certain amount of information you can communicate visually, uh, you have a certain amount of information you're going to be able to communicate in the title, access labels, and so on. And then there's another piece of information you can communicate in the caption, for example. And that pretty much comprises your figure. Now, usually the figure is embedded in some context of a narrative, like, for example, a scientific publication or blog post or some type of communication. And that's an opportunity to talk more about what you did in generating uh, the figure. However, um, really, it's very difficult to communicate all those tiny steps unless you're also letting people access, in our case, uh, your R script that actually went through. So as we go through the class, what we'll be doing is thinking about how to um, write our code in such a way that it encourages this type of transparency so that you can make this stuff available. People can see the, the precise steps you took to generate the plots. Or, or generate your models, or what, what you've been doing as a data scientist, and then hopefully pick out errors, as we know, or at least even bring other pieces of other perspectives and viewpoints to the discussion, which is just hugely invaluable, right? When was the last time you presented an idea that maybe you believe or to the point where you don't really question it anymore, something that's just so obvious, and then one of your friends or whatnot um, kind of brings up a counterexample or makes you think about things in a different way. So really, the ideas that are open like that and are subject to transparency and scrutiny, those are some of our strongest ideas because we're able to really kind of think them through very carefully. So the more transparency we can get around graphics that we're communicating or data science that we're communicating, the better our data science will be. So, um, so giving people access to your coding steps in R script is an important part of what we're actually um, teaching in this class. So this is an ongoing um, exercise, and that's one of the reasons our weekly homeworks are in R, and uh, we'll be developing that as we go through the, through the course. Okay, let me continue on with the slides. Okay, so if we just plot a time series, so what we've been doing on Mauna Loa is gathering these CO2 measurements since 1958, and um, we can go ahead and uh, do this plot and plot CO2 against time. So we have this time series plot you can see. So this is our default, and what it does is it, comes up with those little circles that we've seen before and just kind of throws them all on there. So this isn't bad, <laughs> right? There's a few things you can really see in the data here. You can certainly see this dramatic, or at least in this plot, what looks like a dramatic increase here. So 320 parts per million up to over 380. And remember that our um, regulatory threshold for safety was at 350. Um, the plot is weak in many ways. Um, we've had a lot of class discussion around where plots fail. Um, here you were missing a title. It's kind of obvious what we're trying to do, but a title would be very helpful. Um, the, just putting CO2 here doesn't tell the reader it's parts per million and so on. They need a bit of context to be able to guess that, for example. Um, date and year, that's pretty self-explanatory. However, this line here even though you can see this increase here, uh, it's kind of thick and jumbled, and you're probably thinking, like, as a reader, that there's probably more information in here and what's going on and so on. Okay, so this isn't totally satisfactory. So what we can do is, instead of using points, we can plot our time series with a line. So this helps a little bit. So we haven't done things like fix the axis labels and titles and so on, but now we can see that this actually, the thickness of the line of all the previous points has a certain regularity to it. So there's actually more structure and more pattern in that data than what you would have seen with that, this guy, whoops, uh, that one, that thick line where we don't really see, which just sort of looks like maybe, maybe it's like 
measure a lot of measurement error, like our sensor's not very precise and it's jumbling around. Um, if we look when we plot with a line, you can see there's actually um, uh, quite a bit of structure and quite a bit of regularity. So it's probably not just measurement error that's, that, that was causing that thick line. We wouldn't have known it on the last plot. Okay, so if we connect with line segments, now we've got this sort of cyclical nature. So if we look sort of down here, you see 1958, 1959, 60, it looks like these are probably annual cycles, right, with seasons and so on, um, and changes in wind patterns and so on. So that probably makes some intuitive sense. Okay, let's keep going. Um, okay, so what we'd like to do is to kind of combine the information that's in that first plot where you do see that dramatic rise um, in CO2 levels over time with the seasonality component and help people's eye kind of separate what's this sort of cyclical, small cycle seasonality component in the time series from the up larger upward trend. So in thinking about how this is related or whether it's related to increases in global temperature, uh, we're not as interested probably in that small seasonal cycle, the annual um, fluctuations in CO2, especially since if you notice these fluctuations are pretty stable over time, right? So what the, the sort of seasonal amount of variability happening around 1958, 1959, 1960 looks to me in sort of this plot uh, about the same as what's happening in 2010, 2011, and so on. So it doesn't seem to be a big shift over time in the cyclical or seasonal component of the time series data. So in a sense, that's not what you want to emphasize, right? We're looking for things that have changed over time and might be correlated with or um, uh, somehow part of the story of rising temperatures. It looks like this seasonal component is not part of the story. It's just not changing, right? If this came, became wildly cyclical over here, we might say, oh, okay, that, that's probably part of the story, but this has remained fairly stable. So what we want to do is de-emphasize that in the plot. Again, you're making these judgments around um, accuracy in presentation of information, and yet you're choosing um, the important pieces of information you want to draw out and draw people's eye to. So what's important here is uh, this increase in um, the CO2 uh, over time. So this red line here allows people to um, sort of quickly pick out the trend line. So we have this fairly, um, what looks like in this plot, fairly steep increase uh, as represented by that, by that red line. The red line also helps people realize that what you're trying to communicate is the increase and not to focus on that cyclical or seasonal component in the data. Remember what I said in class too, like you want to think that your people reading or understanding your plots are really smart, <laughs> they almost always are. Um, however, they generally speaking don't have the same background or experience with the data that you do. So you want to make things, I mean you've been working with it, right? You've been making these plots uh, and trying to understand the data and putting a lot of um, effort into that. So what you want to do is make this um, as easy to understand as possible. So putting on that red trend line is a step to say towards saying, here's what I want you to focus your attention on on the graph, the fact that we've got this increasing trend, and making that cyclical component fall into the background by making it black says we're not, um, we're not worried about what's happening in the seasonal component. So it sort of gives these hints. Okay, we're getting a little bit better in our <laughs> in the plots here. Uh, I got a parts per million. Uh, we're kind of letting people know that on the um, Y label here and uh, monthly average CO2. Well, that that's helpful, right? Now we know at what scale um, the data are being collected, and we probably could have guessed that, right? Because uh, we've got years on the bottom here, and then we've got we must have more than annual measurements because. Um, We've got the cyclical component, but um, we don't know. It could have been taken monthly, it could have been taken bi-weekly, but now we know we've got the monthly average here, which is very helpful. Okay. Um, so last class I talked about banking, and I talked about aspect ratio, and I talked about what is um, one of the easiest ways for us to understand information, particularly relative changes in data in a plot. And... Um, we talked about having that trend line. So if you have an upper trend line, or 
could be a downward trend line. Um, it's easiest for us to grasp what's going on when that line is around 45 degrees. Now, as I said last class, it's not always possible. Not all data lends itself to this, even with transformations. Some data do. So um, we talked about, for example, doing log transformations um, on data, either y-axis or x-axis or both, to try and bring out that 45 degree line. So we have that in, um, to some degree in the Mauna Loa data. And so here, this height-width ratio of the data reason, region is about 1. We've got that approximately around 45 degree line um, in our long-term trend. And, um, and then there's a couple of pieces of information that, that helps our viewers. So for example, this banking to 45 degrees, um, it allows us to see convexity. So um, we can see that the, the trend line, the red line, um, is increasing more steeply as time goes on. So we can actually think about that derivative. And uh, that's something that with correct banking, hopefully people's eye could actually pull out. Okay, so here, um, for example, there seems to be around 1988, it starts to get a little bit steeper. It's not a huge change, but um, certainly if you look at this early piece here, this segment um, early on here around 1958 to whatever it is, 65 or something like that, you don't have to be super precise, is certainly flatter than what's happening here. So there's been this change, and it seems to be accelerating um, to what's happening on the right-hand side of the plot. Okay, um, so these types of discussions aren't isolated, as you know. Um, interpreting uh, data in plots is something that um, certainly we're going to have a lot of discussions on in class and is very um, important to data science and people who are interested in um, understanding what data have to say and understanding the world around us in a quantitative way. Um, but we're not the only ones that are interested. So this, of course, is, the, is one of the things that can come up um, in Congress. So in 1981, so quite a few years ago, almost 40 years ago, um, uh, 35 years ago, uh, the Senate convened um, scientists for testimony on global warming, trying to understand um, is this a threat and what's the nature of the threat and what can we do about it? What's our involvement in this as um, you know, people using fossil fuels? Um, so Al Gore was a senator then, and um, he says that the Mauna Loa data, similar to what we've been talking about in class, demonstrates that we do have this CO2 increase. So this is actually all uh, public, you can kind of go look at this discussion in Congress and Senate if you're if you're interested. Um, there was a witness for the Department of Energy. So Department of Energy does quite a bit of science funding in the U.S. It particularly specializes in funding a very big um, um, instrumented science. So, for example, if you have a very big telescope, for example. Um, DOE might be funding that. National Science Foundation also funds some telescopes and so on. Um, but DOE seems to specialize. So for example, there's a new initiative by the White House that was just announced a few years ago called the National Strategic Computing Initiative. And uh, this is, you might have heard this announcement, um, the US government is going to build um, a, uh, an exascale um, supercomputer, which has not ever been built. Um, uh, in the U.S. and uh, um, is a sort of breaking through a new level of speed <laughs> in terms of flops. Um, and uh, it's in partnership with the different funding agencies and the Department of Energy is going to be the one taking the lead on building the actual supercomputing hardware. And they just have this track record of um, um, funding these science, the, um, the big instrumentation for science. So it's not surprising that they're involved in the, the Mauna Loa discussion. So Pewitt is a scientist who um, was speaking on behalf of, um, oh, I actually, I don't think he was a scientist, I'm sorry, but he, he, he was brought by DOE. And um, uh, he's saying that the graph is misleading because it doesn't include zero. Now, I don't know what um, people were thinking what you all were thinking um, when we were looking at this. Were you concerned about the fact that the origin is not explicitly included here? So that may have been something that you noticed or didn't notice. Um, 
if the origin was included, where it, you can see the scale here, 320, 340, 360, 380, zero is way, way down, right? And um, so what's happening here, without including the origin, we get these features to come out of the plot that we're interested in, like this is sort of acceleration and in the increase in the trend. And this is um, evident to people looking at the plot. However, it if you glance and you're not reading the plot carefully, it looks like our CO2 might have been going to, from close to zero to really, really massive. <laughs> so, um, so you want to be really careful about how you're communicating this information. So if you were um, following along in the lecture and you weren't thinking about um, origin here, you were thinking about our discussion about bringing out the salient features in the plot, and then suppose you were called as a witness in Congress to talk about your science and it might impact um, policy and you have plots and you want the, the senators to, to try and understand the data and then suddenly the senators come up with things, well, why don't you have zero in there? Don't you think that's misleading? It looks like we've gone from zero to, to, to huge, you know, 400 or whatnot. And um, so what do you say? You have to be prepared to defend your work. And you have to be prepared when you present your work that people have very different perspectives and different ways of reading the data and um, trying to think through all these different perspectives and, um, and have reasons why you've chosen to include something or not include something or withhold some information or present some information. Because those are all the artistic judgments that you're making when you're, um, when you're doing these plots. Okay, so let's take a quick look here. So Pewitt goes, this is a clever piece of chartology. So the idea being that you can read it is much more dramatic than what it is. Uh, to me, it looks, still looks pretty dramatic, but you can read it, like I said, possibly going from zero up to something higher, uh, something very high, and have it look very dramatic. Um, so he goes, it's intellectually just exactly correct. It displays 315 going to 336, but it appears to be going from zero to very large amounts. We actually, I don't know why they say 315 to 336. Our data, I guess because it's 1981, our data goes up to 2011. So we've got a little more. Um, so um, Pewitt was actually countered in this debate and um, was people were saying, well, you know, your point about the including the origin or not actually um, is not really even a valid criticism. Um, so let's take a look actually as, as why that, that might be considered not a valid criticism. And what I'd like you to do is just maybe pause my uh, video and um, think about would you include the origin or not, or what do you think of this criticism and how would you respond to it if you were presenting, say, in the Senate? And remember, you're under a lot of pressure there, the press is all around reporting, it's a big issue and so on, and these senators are raising objections and uh, witnesses for the DOE are raising these objections. What would you say um, if people started to say, well look, I can't, well, that's a really misleading piece of work you've done, you haven't put the origin on there. Okay, so here's what happens if you put the origin as you could probably imagine. If we maintain the same scale and then we add the origin, it looks something like this, right? Um, so this, this violates some of our um, guiding principles around the graphical display of information. So you remember that one of the things we wanted is um, uh, a chart to look full in a way. Information rich is what we were calling it. So having this huge amount of white space here, even though technically it does communicate the scale and uh, here's the zero and so on, um, it leaves you with kind of an ugly plot that's harder to interpret. It's hard to see what's going on. I mean, this is a little bit, we're showing sort of a small scale on this panel on the slide. Um, but, uh, but it's hard to see the, the cyclical movements around um, the seasons. Uh, they just kind of look all sort of blurred together here and so on. And it's hard to see that. You know, we, we, we've overlaid the, the trend line, the red line there, and it's kind of still hard to see what's going on. It just kind of looks like one thick line. Okay, um, so we end up with this tall and narrow plot and we're still trying to preserve that banking at 45 degrees, that, um, that ability to um, help people interpret the, the data on the plot, particularly in a time series situation. Okay, so this kind of looks unsatisfying, right? 
Um, I'm not sure that it's actually easier to interpret. Uh, what we could do actually to help allay those concerns about the origin is make it much clearer what we've done on the Y label. And remember I talked about in class we put in little sort of this kind of sideways Z's and so on to indicate when we're sort of making a leap in the axes because we've got blank space. So I, you could imagine have maybe put zero here and then have like an, a, a, a Z there to show that people are gonna, we're going to skip. And then if you start around 300 and go up, we can still have a reasonable looking plot. And you maybe even want to call out attention to that in your caption or in better still even in the um, Y label here so that people are really not thrown. You never want to um, uh, mislead or, or throw people in a plot. You, you want to sort of accurately get that information out there. Um, the other thing we could do is stretch the plot. Um, and then what we're trying to do is reduce the amount of white space and make this more information rich. So we could try to kind of instantiate that principle this way. Um, but you can see this is really very difficult to interpret now. So uh, the plot from several slides ago, the one that the senator and so on, or Pewitt, I guess, was uh, objecting to, you could really see, for example, how the rate of increase in CO2 was increasing as time went on. Here, that's difficult to see. This kind of looks uniformly flat at all parts because we've stretched it and kind of obliterated that information. And, um, and you can see the increase. It really de-emphasizes um, the increase here because we're respecting that 45 degree. We've, um, we've, we, you can see that going from approximately 300 to approximately 400. Um, here, you kind of have to sort of squint and see, okay, yeah, there's 300, and it goes up to 400 there. We don't even have nicely labeled tick marks because this axis is so compressed, um, although I guess we forced <laughs> zero on there. Um, and still, you know, we're trying to fill this and make this more information rich, but in my opinion, there's still quite a bit of white space in this plot, although in terms of white space, this top one and the, the tall, narrow one is worse. Okay, so somehow these don't satisfy, right? Um, I doubt when there was a discussion around this um, on the Senate floor that um, people presenting the plots actually had this in the back pocket and can pull it out and just say, look, this doesn't look very good when you do this. Um, so kind of anticipating how your viewers might interpret plots and being very, very clear is really important. Okay, so um, uh, I also wanted to touch on um, a very famous plot. So, um, in a sense, I don't think there's a discussion about visualization and data science that would be complete without talking about this plot. This is one that I also, in my most recent email to you, sent um, a, a link to an image that was higher resolution than the one that actually get into the slides. The slides just, they, they compress for size, and uh, it's not as high resolution as what I would like. And um, so this is um, a plot by Menard, and uh, it was done in the 1800s, and it's very, very famous. And what he did is he was tasked with um, uh, plotting, you know, characterizing Napoleon's march on Moscow. So let's take a look at the, at the plot. So I'm hoping you can actually bring up the um, higher resolution one here and take a look at it. So one of the things that you notice right away aside from seeing the two blobs of color on there, is that there's a lot of really small, tiny writing. So this is, um, this is an artifact in the sense of, of course in those days these were all done by hand and you would have a lot of handwriting on there. Um, these days we wouldn't do it that way. We would have things like, you know, captions or um, text and so on. So he had a lot of writing about um, what was happening. So this plot, it's... Um, so if I was in class with you, <laughs> what I would ask you is, well, what's the one salient piece of information that Menard is trying to um, communicate here? Or is there one? Or maybe he's doing a couple or maybe a few more. Um, so what's, what's actually, what is the plot actually trying to tell you? And, uh, and I would actually pause here <laughs> and wait for people to put up their hand. So, um, uh, so Take a look at the plot and try and just don't worry too much about the writing um, and try to understand what Menard might have been trying to um, communicate. So you can see here we've got some indication of Moscow. So this is actually where the army marched on, on Moscow. And then um, back here you can see this is actually where Napoleon's army started. 
So there's a couple of things that, um, that Menard is trying to communicate here, but primarily the one piece of information that, that is being communicated here is um, how unsuccessful that campaign was in terms of human life. And this is immediately apparent because, so this, as soon as you kind of understand how Menard chose to display it, so this width here of this kind of, I don't even know what that color is, like faded yellowish brown, or something. Um, so this color, this width is um, the size of the army in terms of men. And so this is going over time and going over space. So they're marching and marching and marching um, from Europe. They're going all the way over and all the way up to Moscow. Now this of course is a very famous march because Napoleon chose to march right into the Russian winter. And, um, and his army was decimated, and actually it was a very unsuccessful march. And so we see this with the number of men here, and they start marching and marching and marching, and then there's a small branch off that kind of goes up here, and these proportions are accurate. So this is the proportion of men relative to this total that went off on this side branch, and again, I apologize for how blurry these little ones are. If you're looking at the other uh, plot in the link that I sent you, then... Hopefully you can read these cities, but these were this was a side um, side campaign, and then you can see there was fighting up here in this side campaign because this black line is um, the return, and so and and again here this black or maybe it's a really dark brown, but this is the, the return right there are always the returns, and so the troops come back from that fighting, and and right here you can see this was a battle where they took a lot of losses um, this black line is a lot skinnier than the sort of beigey line and so you can at a glance um, see the toll on the number of men uh, that that battle took. So this dark line rejoins and then and the march continues and so on. And then there's another side campaign here, quite a substantial uh, uh, subset actually branched off to the north to have this campaign and they sort of walk in parallel to the main group of um, men uh, and then they're fighting and then they decide to return and they sort of come down here and they actually return to troops on the way back. So this, this campaign took a lot of time and they were sort of waylaid out here fighting. Okay, so the, the main body of the army are continuing to march and you can see they're being whittled down. So this is getting narrower and narrower. So here it looks like about half the men are here. So that's substantial, right? They're not even halfway to Moscow yet. And you can visually see that, right? And about half minutes. So this is, this is winter. So there's one other thing going on in this plot that's um, key for you to understand. You see this, this line down here? This line is giving temperature information. And actually, it's doing it in, unfortunately, a little bit confusing way. So I might fix this and sort of make this a more normal looking temperature plot because it looks like the temperature is increasing. But if you, if you, um, can read French, this says here that the temperature is the degrees um, below zero, which is like a confusing thing to write. But anyway, so as this is increasing, it's getting colder. Um, and so here we've got this big cold streak here. It's getting much, much, much colder here. And you see this corresponding um, shrink in the number of men. And so your eye can kind of pick out how these two things are working together. And so it gets a little bit warmer here and the men continue to march and continue to march and there's kind of a sort of stability here uh, they're not shrinking that much um, it starts to get colder again they start shrinking again um, and eventually they make it to Moscow so this is their march on Moscow now what the eye does is it can kind of see um, the width here and compare it to the width at the beginning now there was a side campaign um, that hasn't come back but the impact in terms of number of men is dramatic and striking. And so this is a very powerful way to communicate the information where you could look at the numbers in a table and they're just not going to have that same impact. And you're also not going to get that information over time about the decimation of the army and how it's um, correlated with the weather. Okay, so then they turn around. And so now we've got, we're in the black here, we've got the return and they start marching back. And they're marching and marching. And it's still... Um, uh, very difficult. And you can see that the, the, the group that decides to come back, uh, they're sort of doing okay here, and then they start shrinking again. 
and uh, people are dying and uh, this is actually very very tiny so here about halfway back or maybe a little more than halfway back we're down to this little thread of people and um, and then they pick up the those troops that did the sort of sojourn up top um, so this things thicken a little bit it's um, uh, very rough going especially over as they're crossing this river uh, lost a lot of troops it's thin again and then actually we pick up that those troops from above here at that point well sorry that's the mouse um, and then you but and then you can see that they join up so this is a little thicker when they get to the end but it's this tiny sliver compared to the troops that started out again the visualization is extremely powerful in terms of how this march simply decimated um, the um, infantrymen that actually uh, started out on this march. Okay, very powerful, very famous plot. Um, I'd like you to think about in the back of your mind ways that you might improve it given modern technology. So they, they just had to work with the resources that we had. Okay, so this is just a summary of what's happening on the Menard map. So the size of the army is the thickness of the band. And these individual battles um, and crossing rivers and so on, you can see the effect, like where the troops actually were um, immediately decimated, where weather was attritioning them, um, and conditions and so on. Uh, this sort of very clear effective summary, this is what exactly what you're going for when you're doing um, display of quantitative information. Uh, there's a quote, E.J. Mari, seeming the, the Menard's plot is seeming to defy the pen of the historian by its brutal eloquence. So a lot was written about that march on um, Moscow because it was um, so tragic. However, that map just lays it bare right in one page. Okay, so we have size of army. Uh, he's uh, got date information. We're looking at what the army is doing over time. We have location information, so we know latitude, longitude, how the how the mar army is actually marching up on Moscow. So it's all to scale. Temperature information is at the bottom, and then he's used the two colors to show advance and retreat. Right, so taking that beigey color out and then coming back on black. Quite clever. <laughs> and also incorporating um, the different elements that we've been talking about, about display and visualization. If you just had this information, you had army size, date, location, da da da, um, I don't think it's intuitively obvious you would right away come up with Menard's um, uh, display. It, this is, you know, you sort of would think about it, I, I, at least I would think about it a little bit and before I actually came up with that, so it's not, um, visualization is, is very hard to do well. It just takes practice. Okay, so, um, so that's the end of our graphics uh, slide deck. So I'm going to continue on now with um, the next one. We're going to get back into a little bit of our coding and um, start talking about lists and talk about one of the key um, functions in R, which is apply. Extremely important. Okay, so let me, let me get this set up here for you. Oops. Should have done that before, but uh, anyway, okay. Okay, so now I'm in slide deck five, lists and apply the PDF, which is in Moodle. Um, all the all the lecture notes are in Moodle. So data frames, lists, and matrices, and the apply family of functions. Um, so what we're doing here is we're kind of interspersing learning R with doing these uh, the visualization and the display. So I'll just continue along in that theme. Okay, so let's start with some data. The 2012 Summer Olympics, uh, this is data you'll end up working with, actually. So, um, 2012 Olympic athletes, I shouldn't have this. Um, sorry for having the apostrophe there. Um, so, The Guardian, which is a newspaper in um, the UK, uh, for the 2012 Olympics had um, the sort of viewer or UI for the data. And it has information on all the athletes that were competing. And what you could do, you can see up here, there's a search box, a click athlete's name to highlight sport and country. And, um, and there was this entire visualization. You could see the representation of different athletes and different sports and by country, men, women, so on. So uh, lots of descriptive information. So we can uh, actually grab the data from this. I did take the data from this for you. Um, here's the URL. 
and we can read it into R. We'll use our good friend read.csv. It is actually a CSV file, so that's very convenient. Okay, so um, uh, with read.csv or read.table, um, just to go over some of the options, so you want to make sure that when you read data in, you tell it what file you want to bring in, whether or not there's a header. So last class, uh, I mentioned an example of mistakes that are very commonly made when people take CSV files and bring them into R to do the analysis. They might do some data pre-processing externally to R. They bring it in to do plotting, visualization, analysis, modeling, and uh, a common mistake is not to be careful about whether there's a header in the um, file or not. So one of the things, so I'm not, as you all know, I'm not a big fan of using Excel in scientific research. And one of the reasons is it, it's very, it's impossible pretty much to track um, manipulations that you make on the data. So for example, in Excel, it's very easy to do things like delete a column or a row, and then suddenly there's no evidence that was ever done. How do you trace it? Whereas if we did that in R, we could have that step encoded in our script, and we could tell people what we actually did. So it's much, um, it's much better to, to use um, a language more like R to process data than clicking around in Excel where it's very difficult to reconstruct what you did and how that um, data set was transformed. However, you can have no headers in Excel, so no column names in Excel, and yet if you export from Excel as a CSV file, um, it will add um, column names for you. Um, sometimes. So you, you can sometimes, with the best of intentions, go ahead and read your data set into R if you're taking it from Excel and say there are no, uh, there's no header information and yet Excel has added, has added some. And so you can end up messing up your first observation, which is really awful. Okay, so um, we need to be very careful of the header information. Always just check that in the CSV file and make sure that is right. Never make an assumption on that. It's just too important. Um, R does not have a built-in check. As you know, R thinks you're brilliant and <laughs> thinks you know what you're doing, and it really just tries to do whatever you want, and it doesn't throw up a bunch of questions and exceptions at you. So you got to take care of all this stuff yourself. Um, SEP. So the SEP function says, uh, what's our delimiter? How is it? How are the data separated? Uh, that's for read.table. Read.csv assumes you have commas in there. Na.strings uh, tell R how to interpret missing values, um, so it can put in Na for you. Um, especially other programs use things like periods or numerical codes or whatnot, so you, just, you can tell R how to interpret that as a missing value. And then if there is more information at the top of the file, which is fairly common, for example, if you've taken data from the web, you may have a lot of header information in the file, and you can tell um, R to go ahead and skip that when it's reading it in, for example if you need to, or if it's not a problem, just ignore that. Okay, so we might ask something like, if a country is wealthier, at least as measured by GDP, and there's a greater population, so for example, you may have more people to um, uh, uh, pull Olympic athletes from, uh, does that mean that you're more likely to win medals, like raw number of medals? So we can actually get the... Um, uh, GDP data and add it to Olympic data. So now we have this country level data. We're using, at least here, you can see in this display, they're using this, the ISO codes for the different countries. So three letters uh, standardized and how to identify different countries. Uh, number of gold medals, silver medals, bronze medals, total, total weight points. Okay, so they're just adding up. Um, not exactly sure why they want to actually have total weight divided by points, but anyway. Um, and then we have GDP information here. Okay, so let's try and put that into R. Um, so we can use read.csv on this data, and um, you can actually just go through, since we grabbed this um, many eyes data again that I talked about last class. Um, by the way, when I talked about many the many eyes product, I think I mentioned that um, it had been bought by IBM, so that's why you see this, this IBM.com um, uh, information here. Okay, so country, CTRY, will create this variable, or this data set um, object with read.csv, um, give a URL of where it can find the data, skip the first line. Our separator here is going to be um, tab, 
So we could use read.table, for example. No header information. Well, we're going to skip the first line so we can d dump the header information in this particular data set. And then um, column classes. So this command allows us to um, instruct our on how to store the vectors that are in each column in this file. So it's a concatenation C of a character variable. And then we're going to have five numeric variables and then three character variables. Okay, so let's take a look at what we got. So we can use a head command, and as we know, that's going to give us the first six observations of country. And so we see, this, we see the same thing on the previous page. This is what we wanted. We see these ISO codes, ABW, AFG, and so on. So that looked good. Um, here are our metal counts and so on. So that looks about right, too. Let's just take a quick peek. Yep, that looks all good. Um, and then we see the GDP information here, too. Da -da -da -da. Okay, so that looks great. And then we've got other pieces of information here, like population and so on. Okay, so what's happened is, there, so, so at least it got the stuff read in, right? And the numbers look right, and the information looks right. So what we want to do is then be a little bit picky. So um, personally, I'm not a huge fan of v, like ours, V1, V2, V3. I understand why R is doing that. If we don't give names information, it's just going to go variable one, variable two. It doesn't have much choice. It wants a name, so it just invents one for us. Um, however, it would be nicer if we actually gave it that names information and easier for us to work with, less likely for us to get confused. Uh, and then the other thing that's happened is the original data, if we go just sort of back one here, you can see there are commas in those numbers. This is really um, a very common way to store um, these large numbers, particularly when humans are going to be reading it. And what R has done, we didn't instruct R any differently, so what it's done is it's actually read these in its characters, and as we know, if there's any character at all in there, it doesn't matter how many numbers you have, then R will classify that whole thing as character. And um, entire vectors, so this entire column, needs to be only character or only numeric. It just gets one classification, so it just is going to make these all character. Um, so this rep character, we sort of forced it. And, um, uh, so that would have happened anyway, actually, if we had read that in. Okay, so what do we need to do? So we can't do any mathematics with this if it's character. So what we're going to need to do is take out these commas and periods and so on, um, and then convert to numeric. And then what it would be really good is adding latitude, longitude information for each of these countries. So we can do something like um, actually uh, do spatial location analysis. Okay, so um, to do that, we need to think a little bit more about our um, data structures and how we're actually going to represent the data in R. So now if you remember our, um, our, the basic building block in R for the data structures is the vector. Even when you have um, just an object or like, like a scalar, like you just say x equals 2 or something, that's a vector of length 1 in R. So uh, everything is stored as vectors as much as possible, and that is its, its most basic unit. And um, this is very good, and you'll, we'll see actually um, why it's good a little bit later in the lecture when we get to the apply functions. Um, R has managed to capitalize on this vector construction to be able to carry out some very fast opera operations over vectors. So we'll see that coming up. Uh, so the vector is always ordered. There's a position, position information. You can even see here, when you look back at this country, the one, two, three, da 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 from the data frame, it's always giving you that position information. So the vectors always are ordered. Elements of the same type, they're all numeric or they're all character. Okay, nothing new there. Uh, in the data frame, if you recall, it has this constraint, um, which probably seems crazy to you guys in class. Um, but remember, R came from S, and it came from S+, plus, and these are older functions from the, uh, I'm sorry, older languages from the 80s. And, um, and at the time, statistics and um, data science didn't really exist as a field, and statistics was really more about answering um, questions on observational data, where you had observations, and then you would have measurements on these observations, and you would expect to have the same measure the same things on every observation. And that's what gave rise, that, that framework is what gave rise to the data frame. So the data frame, order container of vectors, every column is a vector, uh, and uh, they're ordered, so that's the like R's default. Vectors have to be the same length, right? So this is this that idea that you've got these observations, if you think of our family data set, and we're taking a measurement to each of these variables on all the observations, 
of course you would have everything the same length. You wouldn't take an object, like a measurement on someone that wasn't in the data set, <laughs> right? Like, that's just not in the paradigm. Um, you know, missing values and so on. But the idea would be you'd expect this to be um, an array. Like, uh, I shouldn't use the word array. You would expect it to be this, um, uh, this sort of rectangular um, representation. All the vectors can be different types, and we've seen that. So you could have measurements that say were blood pressure that were numeric. You could have quote unquote measurements like first name, last name, and so on that are um, that are um, character. Okay, so that's a data frame. So let's take an example of um, wireless data. So what we're going to do is try to manipulate some of this data. The data frame representation in R is still a very useful and pervasive way to represent data. Lots of functions in R um, uh, take data frames, and um, it's easiest to work with those particular functions. If you have your information in a data frame, that's just a legacy part of R. Um, but you can see that, that having the same length of um, variables, so the same number of uh, measurements for each observation, is kind of restrictive, and uh, we're going to start breaking that apart. Okay, so let's look at a little bit more complicated data set. So this is um, wireless data. So if you imagine, say, the Gisless building or whatever your favorite um, building is, um, now imagine that there, well, hopefully there's more than five, but we're going to take a simple example. There's five wireless access points. So there's um, signal being emitted from five, say, for example, routers or whatever it is um, in, in the building. And then what you're going to do is um, take your laptop and actually ping the wireless network in the building and what you're going to do is um, see the strength of the signal that you get from each of the five access points. So every time you ping the network, you're going to get five observations back, which gives you the strength of the signal from um, access point one, access point two, access point three, and access point four. Okay, and the other piece of information is you want to know where your laptop is, right? And then you can see you're not just going to pick up dead zones or zones a very strong signal, but you'll actually know which signal emitting device is actually doing it and how close you were and whether that makes a difference. Okay, so you go around and you actually um, take, you, you emit a signal and measure the, the strength of the signal at 254 locations in the building. I'm guessing you just sort of carry the laptop around and it's doing it automatically. Okay, so here's um, a command to read the table, uh, the information into R. I um, have that available on my website there for you to, to go ahead and use. Okay, so, um, so let's start investigating what happens when we actually read that information in. So one of the things that you might start with is, well, what is the class of, in this case we called the object we read in, W. So what's the class of W? Uh, R tells us it's a data frame. Okay, so we're working in the data frame context. Do we have names on um, the variables that are actually in that data frame? Names of W gives us a series of names X, Y, S1, X, S2, S3, S4, S5 for the signal emitters and X, Y giving us the location of the laptop. So that looks good. Um, if you haven't given our header information or names information, it's probably going to um, you know, give you the old v1, v2 stuff as names, maybe, or it might give you a null vector here. Um, dim, so as you know, I like to, um, after reading in a data set, always do the dim function and just make sure that, that something sane happens. So we've got 259 observations and seven variables here. That seems about right, although we've got three, right, that are 59, so we've actually got five more than 254. I'm not sure what that discrepancy is. I will need to figure it out. Okay, so here are what the data look like. So we've got x, y giving us some location information, 255 and 144, um, and then signal strength. I actually forget why these come up as negative, but whatever it is, they're, they're, giving, they're measuring um, the signal strength. So those are our measurements at each of the locations. A very, very useful command in R, I'm not sure if we've run across it yet, is summary. So you can apply the summary command to all sorts of objects in R. When you apply it to a variable, so here we're going to apply it to the first signal strength variable, 
in W, so that's what's happening here, W dollar sign S1, so we're pulling out the S1 variable, applying summary, and you can see it gives us a very rough and ready um, first cut at distributional information for that variable. So here it gives us minimum, first quartile, which minus 90 there, median is 80, mean um, uh, minus 77, so comparing just at a glance, mean and median gives you an idea of whether there's sort of heavy tail, one of the tails is um, longer than the other side, for example. Uh, third quarter um, quartile, I'm sorry, information happening at 71, and then our max is minus 33. Okay, and then we can use actually all the tools that we've been developing around subsetting. So, for example, show me the um, values of signal strength for the second signal emitter when X is greater than 200. So, for example, in some part of the building, like this might be the north side or something, when X is greater than 200, what's our signal strength so we can pull it out this way. Um, so we can subset rows and columns of the data frames, just like what we've been working on for the last few weeks. And doing the same thing as what we've been doing, subsetting by position, exclusion, logical subsetting, name, all, any, and so on. All our usual tools. Okay, so the, the issue with that particular data frame where it has X, Y, location information, and then it has uh, this, the five signals, we may want to actually reformat. It's pretty common to restructure a data frame so that we can apply... Um, functions to it, or um, analysis tools, or plotting tools, and so on. So it's a good exercise to go through. So on the left here, here's our layout as it stands right now for the data frame. Um, X, Y, S1, da, da, da. Um, So what we would like to do is change this to, to um, this sort of longer, skinnier um, data frame where we have X, Y information, and then instead of having it go across the columns, it'll go down in one column, so across the rows. For each X, Y, we'll repeat this five times and then have S1, S2, S3, S4, S5. Okay. We can label the access points. So here's our signal strength, SS, our access points. Um, one, two, da, 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 da. And what we start getting interested in is distance. So here I can take um, our location information and actually calculate a distance metric that I'll, I'll talk to you about um, in one moment. Okay, so we actually, there's no silver bullet on um, uh, setting up a new data set like that. We can do things like um, transpose and so on, and flip rows and columns, but that's very crude, right? Like literally all you're going to do is flip rows and columns. Um, to actually do a new structure like what you see on the right, we're going to have to build, build up what we want by hand. So um, X, what we're going to do is repeat the X value five times, repeat the Y value five times, so that gives us our X, Y, X, Y, X, Y, all the way down five times. Um, AP, we can actually just um, uh, create this variable labeling the access points one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five directly. So here we're going to repeat one to five each, and we're going to go through until we've got the number of rows in W. So hopefully that comes out divisible by five. <laughs> it should, if our data makes sense. Um, uh, signal strength, we concatenate um, signal one information, signal two, signal three, signal four information. And then we'll create our distance values. So this is just actually, you can see Euclidean distance here. So we're going to take the square root of the distance in X from the first access point in X squared plus the distance of Y from the first access point in Y squared. So we're going to have these, um, instead of just seeing these raw coordinates for where you were located in the building when you were taking that um, observation of signal strength, now we're going to actually calculate how far you were from the access point. So this is um, uh, probably more useful information than just sort of knowing sort of raw coordinates of where you were. So the thing to note about this slide is we're doing a lot of this by hand, right? So um, we're sort of programming these functions and these transformations ourselves. And that's totally normal. <laughs> okay, so dist, remember we had that distance um, variable in the transform data set that we wanted. So dist is just a concatenation of distance 1, g2, d3, d4, d5. And then we can create our new um, data frame, new w. We're going to use the data frame function to force this to have the class of data frame. 
and then x equals x and y equals y. Okay, so we've got our new um, xy information here, and then we include AP that we built by hand, signal strength that we built from the previous data set, and dist that we built from our distance, our Euclidean distance function that we applied to the um, relevant information in the previous and the old data, all in the previous slide. Okay, so we're going to come back to that. Um, we're going to take a little sojourn here into lists. We've talked a little bit about lists. So data frames are a list with the constraint that all the elements of the list are one vector. Um, so we've got these columns, these uh, variables, and then they're all the same length. So remember we had that constraint, but we don't have to have that. So there are more general objects in R, and lists allow you to um, uh, have representations in R for those more general objects. So for example, a list could have vectors in it just like a data frame. It could also have a matrix in there, so we've talked about matrices a little bit. And you can even put things like data frames inside the list. You can actually put other lists inside lists and so on. Lists are really general, just sort of containers that bring together um, objects in R. So, unlike a data frame, each element in a list can have a different length, and each element of a list can be a list, data frame, vector, matrix, whatever you want. You can package it up on a list. Very, very flexible. Okay, so here's um, an, an, a nice ex an example I like uh, to show how lists actually work. So, if you can imagine, um, sort of continuing with our climate theme, um, if you can imagine five weather stations collecting information on rainfall. So in this case, we have um, one measurement for every day. So each sensor will return um, a number on, I think, how many millimeters of rain actually fell that day. And so if you, so this, this is a natural um, candidate for list structure. So if you look on the right here, you can see this list called rain, and it has these five vectors in here one for each of the stations that's recording um, the rainfall information. And they have, um, you know, different lengths here because they have been in operation for different lengths of time. So as these stations are in operation and collecting their rainfall data, um, uh, you know, time goes on and they just add to their the length of this variable, and then some have just been oper in operation longer, so they have more data points here. Okay, all numeric, um, all those millimeter um, uh, points, or observations, I guess. Okay, so this is the type of thing where uh, a data frame would really fail. You would end up with a bunch of, say, missing information padded on here that the data frame would try and do to try and make these all um, the same size, it makes it unwieldy, and just um, uh, takes up too much memory, and there's, why would you, why would you even do that, right? So we've got, um, We've got a list here to, to, to handle the situations where a data frame is not natural. Okay, so you can go ahead if you are interested, and which I highly recommend doing, uh, and load the rainfall data from my website. So I've got the command here on uh, load URL, da da da. And so this RDA, as you know from the family.rda um, um, data set, it's uh, an RDA is a container or package for R, and so you'll have different pieces of information in RDA. Okay, but rain is in there, and we can ask what's the class of rain, meaning the object that appears, and we're told it's a list. Length is five, so remember length is going across the variables, and it's telling you how many objects are in there, and there's five objects in rain. This is exactly the same as for the data frame, so if you ask for a length of a data frame, it's not giving you the number of observations, it's telling you how many variables or how many columns are in there. And it's always doing that, and that's just something that's a little... Un un I found it a little counterintuitive in R, so it's just something to be aware of. And then what are the names? Um, station 050183, da 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 So we got our different, five different station names here. Okay, we went um, through a little bit of information on how to index these lists. We can pull out... Um, one of the elements of the list, so if we want station 050183, we can use rain dollar sign and pull that out by the variable name. What is this? This is a numeric. How long is it? 9878. So in this case, we've pulled out this, um, um, we've pulled out the data for this particular station, and we know there's nearly 10,000 observations here. Um, we can take a look at it by using our old friend head command. <laughs> 
and that gives us our first six observations here, and we can see we got 10 millimeters, 11, and so on. Okay, um, the other thing that we worked on with lists, so lists has this special operator of the double um, square paren, and it can be really useful. So here's how that would work. Now, what we're doing is we're mimicking um, the operations here on the left. So it's a different um, uh, variable that we're after. So station 050945. Um, but we can use these double um, square brackets to pull out this particular subset of the list. So we grab this element. What's its class? Its numeric? What's its length? In this one, we only have 3692 observations. And if we take a look at the first, um, first six observations of, this is the fifth, presumably this, I, let's take a quick look here. Yeah, so this is the fifth one, ST050945. So we can also pull the fifth, call it five, if you don't want to type all of this. Um, 001, because we had a lot of rain on the fifth day there. and so. Okay, so you can peek at the observations. Okay, so you can also pull out these elements um, if you use the single square brackets. You're going to get list information out. So it's going to pull out, so what's um, uh, ST050183, we're going to pull this um, sublist out of rain, so that comes out as a list. And of course it's going to be a list of length 1 because we've only pulled it out for that one station. And so again, it's going across the columns, it's just 1, because it's all we pulled out, so it's going to tell you the length is 1. So you can see it kept that container, it kept that list structure of the elements of the larger list rain, um, because we only use the square brackets. To get the contents of that list out, we'd need to use the double square bracket. So that's the difference between the two. So make sure you can sort of go back and forth between those types of um, usages of um, the square bracket, and you understand that, because that's part of the understanding the structure of lists in R. Okay, um, uh, as you can imagine, um, uh, these have indices. Um, R likes the idea of things being ordered, and it's really useful. So if we want to pull out these individual elements, we have to use this double bracket, as I just mentioned. Um, and then, um, and then we're, we've, we've got a way to pull out, say, this is the first, um, the first element of the list. So this is going to be, let's just take a quick look, um, ST050183. So that's the first one there. And what is it? Numeric. Let's take a look at the data. Blah, blah, blah. Okay. Great. Um, Matrices and arrays. So we looked at this a little bit last class. I'll go through this relatively quickly. Um, matrices and arrays are always a rectangular collection of elements. Um, the matrix, uh, usually this is, has two dimensions with it. And as you start working with matrices more, you'll notice they, are, they still have those vector properties. They actually are vectors. And the vectors carry with it um, row and column information for the elements of the vector instead of just um, ordered straight ordered um, information like you get might get with a regular vector. Um, so you also can do quite fast operations over matrices as well. Arrays, we get up three, four dimensions, and so on. Um, a matrix or an array, in, in a sense it's like a vector in that all the elements have to be the same. So you can end up with a numeric or a character a matrix or array. You don't have a combination in there. If you have a combination, it's just going to be a character. Okay, matrices in higher dimensions, so this is new. We um, haven't fully introduced arrays until this point. We did have a discussion of matrices. So um, here's a little bit about building arrays. So here's the array. We're gonna take the values, just the numbers one to 30, construct an array called X, and the dimensions we're gonna concatenate, we're gonna have um, four, three, and then two. And what's gonna happen is it, this is, to some degree, hopefully is a bit intuitive. So if you think of matrices, matrices are ordered row, then column. This is the same thing, so the array keeps this, row, then column, and then what it does is it says, well, how many of those row column matrices do you want? So what's your additional dimension in a three-dimensional array? Uh, if you had four dimensions, it would be concatenate of row, column, and then the next dimension, and the fourth dimension. Um, okay, so if we look at, we print x in this case, uh, what it does is it's going to index by that last 
um, value. So here we've got two dimensions, and then it'll show us two four by three matrices here. And that's what you see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. So it's doing it. Um, remember we had that discussion between um, column major and row major entering the information. Um, and then it continues in the second matrix, 13, 40, da, 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 up to 24. So it gets to 24, it doesn't use all the 30, that's fine. And, um, and so what X is, is this array is this collection of matrices. So here it's only two, but we've got this collection of four by three matrices and we're pinning them all together as an array. So an array might be useful, for example, if you have data that is observed as a matrix. So for example, you might do an image scan, like an MRI scan, um, for example, and the result of taking one scan is an image. So suppose they scan your knee like five times or something, and they wanted to have one object in R that represented your data, um, those five scans. So you might have something that um, is whatever the dimensions of the scan actually are, like 512 by 512 or whatever it is. And then you'd have five here because you would have your five scans and all those images packed together in an array. Okay, so four rows, three columns, two panels, and then here's how you can do some subdividing and pull different pieces of that um, array out to actually take a look. So make sure you understand that. It's exactly the same thing as um, choosing matrices. So here we're gonna take rows one to two, column three out of the second um, panel or the second matrix. Here we'll take all um, rows, second column for only the first um, matrix or the first panel. And here we'll take the third and fourth row from concatenation of three, one. So what we're doing is taking the third column and the first column, but in that order, third column, then first column for the first um, matrix. So here, let's see, 11, 12, third column, and then three, four is fourth column. Okay, so that actually worked. Um, and then that's how you start to work with arrays. I think it, it, as soon as you start going even above three dimensions in arrays, I think it gets very cumbersome. And you might want to think about other types of um, uh, mechanisms or other ways to maybe sort of store your data, but, um, but in any event. Okay, so let's do a summary of the data structures. So far, so the way um, data is represented in R and housed in R, we've got vector, just our base unit, data frame, collection of vectors, list, collection of vectors and whatever else, <laughs> some very general um, structure, and now we've got the matrix and array. Okay, so here's our graphical representation. Our vector ordered collection of primitive types, meaning that they're all the same type, numeric or character or logical, for example. Um, data frame, all vectors, so we're building on our knowledge of the vector, so these are all, all these four sitting here are vectors, um, uh, all the same length, and um, uh, they have to be vectors in, in the data frame. So think about that old school stat approach. And then the list, we had this earlier, um, where you can collect different um, objects together in, in a list. Okay, so what I'm going to do is stop here so um, folks can take a break, and um, I'll come back with part two of today's lecture. We'll continue on um, with lists and apply. Oops, hang on.